whole heart is for us, is it for all of us? Or is the Torah primarily for people who are Jewish? Yeah. Yes. You think so? <laughs> okay. Well, at least we have one person that uh, has expressed himself. Omar. Um, I can start off by giving you an illustration so that you'll know where I'm going. I think that God is going to, well, I have a lot of things in my mind. Let me put it this way. A number of years ago, about 13 actually, or 14 years ago, the Lord uh, left my wife and myself by uh, our ability and privilege to adopt two orphans from Liberia, West Africa. Uh, now, if you see them, you'll know that they're not the natural children of either my wife or myself because their skin is black. Uh, they don't have an accent anymore, but when they first came, they did. And you would have known that also. There's a, either they're friends that are visiting or something different here. When they came into our family, they took our family name. Their last name is Hay. Uh, their first names were what they originally had, Corona and Fendelin. No. Good. Both are girls, correct. Now, how would it have been if I said to my two sons, it's required for you to be in bed by 10 o'clock in the evening, wiped out in bed? And I said to my two daughters, you can go to bed whatever time you want. Well, it would have caused problems in two directions. First of all, my sons would have said, how come they get to stay up when we don't? I could have told them, well, you're more special than they are, because you're my natural sons. But that, of course, wasn't the case, because even though they're my natural sons, they're no more precious, because all my children are precious, equally precious. Okay, so, the other thing is, my daughters would have said to me, how come you don't make us do the same thing that our brothers do. In other words, part of being a family is to abide by the family rules. And when you abide by the family rules, then you know you're part of the family. For instance, when uh, my sons were growing up and they would come to me and say, Dad, can I do this and such? Can I go such and such? And I would say, no, you, you may not. And they, say, they would say, well, why not? Johnny down the street gets to do it, and what would I say? Well, Johnny is not my son, but you are. So you have to abide by my rule. Now the question is, are the, in the family of God, are Jews the natural children and the Gentiles the adopted children? No. Five times Paul says that what was given to the Jewish people was the adoption as sons. Five times. The Jewish people are adopted by God. There's only one natural son. Right? Everybody, everybody else is adopted. Amen. Amen. So, as the Jewish people, we can't claim any more privilege in the family than anyone else. Amen. We come into the family by grace, not on the basis of our flesh. Right? This is what Paul constantly says. We therefore now no longer know any person according to the flesh. Now, it is true that in the first century, perhaps earlier, the rabbis were teaching that if you're Jewish, you're in. <laughs> if you're not Jewish, you're not in. But if you want to become Jewish, we can help make you Jewish. <laughs> of course, God never gave such a commandment. He said all of his children 
are his children because he has chosen them, adopted them to be in his family. So I can tell you right from the start that my understanding is that there is, we are in the same covenant. We are in the same covenant. Now what covenant are we in? All of it. Okay, I like that answer. Oh, okay. So remember who you Emily. Emily says from the old covenant to the new covenant. You know, I, I have a hard time getting anybody to define for me the old covenant. What exactly is the old covenant? Promise, but in my head. That's the new covenant. From Genesis, from Abraham. What's the old covenant? Is the old covenant the Abrahamic covenant? Well, God said that forever. But I will make you an eternal covenant. How can it be old? Yeah. 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 How about the Mosaic covenant? Is that the old covenant? A lot of people think it is. But if that's the case, then Yeshua couldn't have said, I did not come to abolish the old covenant because what how else could it be old? How many times do you think the word the term old covenant is found in the Bible? Just guess, just guess. One time. Hey, Second Corinthians three. But well, we don't have time to uh, go through all of that. Um, but I can tell you at the beginning. Okay, I'll tell you at the beginning. I believe that all of the children of God who are in the family of God have the same father and have the same rule. And that's because God's rules, or God's Torah, or God's commandments are good. They're filled with blessing. And He does not hold withhold blessing from any of His children. I think I can prove it to you in a number of ways. I want to leave a little more time for uh, question and answer. So, uh, but what about Matthew 28, 19 to 20? Now you all know that uh, it begins with a participle in Greek, so it presumes you're already going. It's not really a command to go. It says, as you are going, or while you are going, make disciples. There is the command. The command that Yeshua gave to his disciples, and then ultimately to us. How do we know it's to us? Because at the end it says, even to the end of the age, I'm the disciples didn't live to the end of the age. Right? So they were to pass it on to us, and we're to pass it on to others. What, what are we to pass on? We're to pass on the commandment to make disciples of all the nations. So when we see all the nations, does this include Jewish people and, and non Jewish as well? Yes. Yeah. Right. So what are we supposed to do with Jewish and non Jewish people as we make them disciples of Yeshua? Well, we're to help. We're, we're to uh, help them do a mikvah, a bat, uh, baptism. What does baptism um, symbolize? Even amongst the rabbis, what does baptism? What does you know what a mikvah is, right? Okay, mikvah is a large uh, base, a place to immerse fully in water. And there were steps that went down. They found many, many, many of them at the southern escape of the Temple Mount. They, of course, Qumran, the Dead Sea people were very fond of, of Mikvahot. And what was the point? You came as though you were unacceptable. Why? Because you were ritually unclean. But you meant what? You couldn't go to the temple, you offer a sacrifice, you couldn't do any of the things that you wanted to do in Jerusalem. So when you went into the Mikvah, it was like you died. And when you came out of the mikvah, it was like you were a new person. Why? Because now you were clean. Now you're ritually clean. Now you can go to the temple, offer your sacrifice, and so forth. So it's like you're a different person. 
Even the rabbis say, when you come, go into the mikvah and come out, it is as though you have been born again. So the mikvah became a symbol of a change of status in life. Uh, you did a mikvah when you were going to get married. Why? Because you're not going to be single anymore. You've made a change in life. Okay, so he told them to do this baptizing as a way of saying that there has been a change of status. They before were not the disciples of Yeshua, now they are the disciples of Yeshua. And they're to be baptized, do the mikvah in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, there are a lot of people who think, oh, maybe a lot is too overdone. There's, there's a n- numbers of scholars who think that that must have been added later. That sounds too Christian. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be written in before the destruction of the temple by that. But I can tell you I've done plenty of uh, research on that and all, and there's no manuscript evidence except very late manuscript evidence. The earliest manuscripts all have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so there you have it. If you're asking the question of the Trinity uh, or the, the plurality of the Godhead, uh, there it is. You know, I can't explain it, but there it is. Some of that. Okay. Then, when we are making disciples of both Jews and non-Jews throughout all the nations. What are we supposed to do besides taking them into the mikvah? We're supposed to teach them to do what? To observe. It's the Greek word tirao, to hold on to, to keep. It's related to the Hebrew word shamar, to hold on to, to guard, which means to do. Teach them to observe, and what are they supposed to observe? All that I, who's speaking? Yeshua. Yeshua. All that Yeshua commanded you. What did Yeshua command his Jews, uh, disciples, the twelve? What did he command them to do? Well, we just we studied it in Matthew five seventeen, didn't we? Right? Not the least commandment. The one who does these and teaches others to do them will be found great. It will be called great in the kingdom. So when he is ready to ascend on high, he tells his disciples, this is what you can see, everything I commanded you. And don't teach them just about it. Don't teach them just to think about it or to talk about it. Teach them to observe it, to keep it, to do it. It sounds to me like he wants every one of his children to live in accordance with Torah, not just Jews. This command is specifically given to making disciples of the nations. And he says, look, beware. Hold on to this with great hope. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I don't see how that could be any clearer. Now, I know that there are a lot of people who say, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. What about? Okay, we'll talk about some of these things. Okay. All right. So to observe means to keep all that I commanded you is all that Yeshua commanded his disciples, which clearly involves his words in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, which we already studied. The disciples who would observe Torah were to make the sounds of Yeshua, who would also keep the Torah. Now, if we ask a simple question, how could this have been so easily missed? How did the early emerging church get off track? You know the answer? The early emerging church moved very quickly into replacement theology. And what is replacement theology? It's the idea that the church replaces Israel. Once the church began to teach replacement theology, they said, essentially, we want to distance ourselves from the synagogue. We don't want to look like the synagogue. And the synagogue also said, we don't want to look like the church. (laughs) We know this, for instance, because it used to be, even even in the rabbinic literature, it says that it used to be in the synagogues that when we did the prayer of confession, we went on to our knees on the floor. But the Talmud says we no longer do this. And why? 
because the Christians do it and we don't want anyone to think we're like the Christians. <laughs> there was a time apparently when in the in the tefillin, you know what tefillin are in the box we were on our head and our arm? There was a time when the Ten Commandments were written in the tefillin box. And the Talmud says, why do we no longer do that? Because we don't want to be confused with the Christians who only do the Ten Commandments, but none of the rest of the Torah. So there was a dividing of the ways between the emerging Christian church and the synagogue. And as a result, there was the desire to distance the church to distance itself from those things which marked Jewish people out as Jewish. Okay, let's get a little history here. You know, of course, that in the first century, actually before the first century, the uh, first century of the before the coming of the Messiah also, there was an enactment of the Roman government that gave the Jewish people the right to worship their God. Okay? You understand that in Rome that you could not be an atheist. In the Greco-Roman government of the first century, atheism was punished by death, by, murder, by uh, capital punishment. So, you had to worship the pantheon of Rome, including the emperor. Okay. However, the Jews were given an exemption. Why? Well, because they had won that exemption during the time of the Maccabees. And each new government agreed that they would uphold that exemption. It gave the Jews the right to gather, to collect money, and to worship their God according to their ancestral traditions and not to worship the emperor or any of the gods of the Romans. So they had an exemption. In order to maintain this exemption, however, there was a lot of things that went underneath the table. That's why you have the tax collectors were hated. The Jewish tax collectors would come and they would charge you far more than you owed. Why? Because they were giving bribes underneath the table to the Romans so that they could maintain the peace and keep everything in equilibrium. In fact, the Roman government was making huge profits off of the temple. The Sadducees regularly gave major amounts of money and gold to the Roman government from the temple. Then what happened in 70? Well, Titus came and destroyed the temple, made the long story short. Stopped the sacrifices, dispersed the people. By the time Hadrian came, uh, some uh, years later, some decades later, uh, made it uh, a law that no Jew could be in Jerusalem except on the night of Av when they were mourning the destruction of the temple. But Rome cut off its nose to spite its face. You know that, Stephen? Yeah. Okay. They realized now when they had destroyed the temple, they also had destroyed their cash flow. Mm -hmm. And that was a good sizable amount of money. So, they instituted the Jewish tax. Fiscus Judaicus. And the Fiscus Judaicus was equivalent to about 4,000 U.S. dollars a year per family, per Jewish family, to be paid in gold. Nothing else. To be paid in gold. If you didn't pay, you went into debtor's prison and you didn't get out until it was paid. The problem that they had when they instituted the Fiscus Judaicus was that they had to define who was a Jew. How do you know who's a Jew and who's not a Jew? At first, before they defined who was a Jew, they had problems. The tax collectors would go into the synagogue and they would say, okay, all of you who, every family in the synagogue needs to pay the Fiscus Judaicus, the Jewish tax. And a lot of people would say, no, we're not Jews. <laughs> so the tax collectors would come out with a third of the money that he thought he would get. And when he paid his supervisors, they said, what do you mean? There's a lot more Jews than that. He said, well, everybody says they're not a Jew. <laughs> so Rome had to come up with a definition of what a Jew was. What do you think they said? If they keep the Sabbath, 
if they eat kosher food, if they circumcise their sons, and if they keep the festivals, no matter what they say, they're Jewish. Now you can understand why the emerging Christian church thought to themselves, why should we pay the Jewish tax? Most of us are not ethnically Jewish. Didn't Paul say circumcision is nothing? Didn't, don't, don't we have the sense that the rest that we have, the rest is in, in the grace of God and Yeshua? Why do we need to rest on the Sabbath day? We're not Jewish. Do we have to eat kosher? Maybe we don't. Do we need to keep the festivals? Perhaps not. Besides, if we stop doing all those things, we won't be persecuted. We won't have to pay the tax. And so what we find is that the emerging Christian church declared themselves to be separate from the synagogue for not only religious reasons, but also for political reasons. And so we have the parting of the ways. And what was the easiest way to make sure the Roman government knew that we were not Jewish? By not observing the Torah. Now, how are we going to do that? We're going to have to allegorize. We're going to have to use a method of interpretation that lets us allegorize the commandments to mean something other than what they actually mean. And what do you find in the earliest strata of the, of the church fathers? You find allegorical hermeneutic. Origen, Irenaeus, the rest of them, they were very much taken to finding a new meaning in the text through allegory. That's not what Yeshua said. By the way, I'll just say one more thing. Uh, I've been laughed at for this, but still so, nobody has given me data to change my mind, so I'm sticking with it. I don't find the so-called Lord's table anywhere in the apostolic scriptures in the New Testament. I don't find it anywhere. 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 is not talking about a communion table up in front of the church sanctuary with juice and bread on it. 1 Corinthians 11 is talking about a whole meal that was celebrated at Passover, it appears to me. And when it says in 1 Corinthians 10, you cannot, he talks about you cannot celebrate the table of demons and the table of the Lord. You mean the demons had a communion table? <laughs> what is the table of the demons? The table of the demons is the altar at the pagan temple. Check it out. A number of, three, two times I believe, perhaps three in Ezekiel, the altar that is reconstructed in the reconstructed temple, the altar that is built, is called the table of the Lord. Mm. So the table of the demons, the table of the demons is the altar in the second temple. The table of the Lord is the altar in the Jerusalem temple. You can't go down to the pagan temple and offer a sacrifice and then go up to the Jerusalem temple and do your Passover sacrifice. But 1 Corinthians 11 is talking about Passover, that's quite clear. He says in 1 Corinthians 5, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven. Right? So he's got Passover on his mind. That's the only place that you have the so-called Eucharist. And it's not even talking about the Eucharist. It's talking about the Passover sacrifice. So why, how did we get the so-called Lord's table? When the emerging Christian church wanted to pull away from the synagogue, they couldn't leave out the words of Yeshua at the last Passover. This is my body which is broken for you. And this is the blood of the new covenant. That was essential for identity with Yeshua. So what did they do? They took those parts out and made a new ceremony. That they celebrated every week rather than once a year. I think there's plenty of historical data to prove that. So, I think Matthew 28, 19 through 20 proves the point without even going any further, but there are other kinds of things we can say. Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says what? All scripture is inspired by God 
And you know that the Abnustos, that Greek word, means breathed out by God. Remember that the word breath can also be, in the Greek, Yuma, that spirit, the word for spirit, can be Ruach. In the, in the, Ruach. In the Hebrew. Ruach. Okay? So, spirit breathing, or the breath of God, it's the work of the spirit, it's inspired. By the way, the English word inspired is, we don't have, I mean, inspired sounds like something you breathe in, right? How do you say breathe out in English? Like, expire, but it also means to die. Right? Inspired. Breathe this last. So that's why we can't say all scripture is expired by God. But literally, that was, that's what it means. All scripture is breathed out, not breathed in, breathed out by God. Now, what is this scripture? It's profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, that is, for, for uh, discipline, for correction, getting us on the right path, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And you can say man of God simply means a person of God. It's not gender necessarily gender related. When Paul wrote this, what did he mean by scripture? He meant the Tanakh. The so called Old Testament. That's the Bible he had. Did you know that in Paul's Bible there was no New Testament? So when he said all scripture is profitable for, for teaching, proof, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, he's talking about the Bible that he had, which included the five books of Moses. So he is teaching us here that the five books of Moses are good for training in righteousness. Training us how to live righteousness. Since the Torah is included in the scripture to which Paul refers, it seems to me patently clear that he intended the Torah to be an ongoing basis for how we live our lives, how we live righteously. So now I go back to where I started at the very beginning. Is the Bible, the 66 books, the sole basis for faith and for practice? Yes, I say yes, for faith and for practice. It's profitable, it's the thing that God gave us, it's the teaching and instruction that He gave us, so that we could be equipped for every good work, for every mitzvah, for all that God intends for us to do. But some continue to say, yeah, but there's, you know, this, the, the whole Torah thing is for the Jews. You know, why do people think that? Let me ask you a question. When you, as a, when you personally read the book of Isaiah, do you feel like you're reading somebody else's mail? Have you ever read somebody else's mail? You know, you see an envelope lying on the counter there, and it's, uh, it's, it's a letter that was written to your daughter, or a letter written to your son, and you look at it, and you look around to see if anybody's watching, and you go over and you open it up and read it to see what it says. And you feel a little guilty about reading somebody else's mail, right? Because it's not to you, it's to them. So when you read the book of Isaiah, do you think you read it like it's somebody else's mail? Why not? It was written to Israel, it wasn't written to you. Am I right or wrong? So why do you think it's yours? <laughs> The emerging Christian church had a big, big problem with that very issue and what was their answer? Their answer was that they came up with the theology that says, we are Israel. We replace Israel. That, therefore, the so-called Old Testament was written to us, not to them. You can read the epistle of Barnabas, which is dated around 90, and he makes it very clear. They are the old people, we are the new people. They have the Old Covenant, we have the New Covenant. The words of God were there, they are now ours. <laughs> well, that's not the way I read the Bible. 
The reason you can, you can read, anyone can read the book of Isaiah and say it was written to me is because we are in Israel. We have been drafted into the chosen people of God. Either we're a natural branch that remains in the tree or is regrafted into the tree by faith, right? Yeah. How are the natural branches broken off? Why? Because of unbelief. Yeah. Disobedience. Unbelief. And why are the wild branches grafted in? On the basis of their belief. Faith. So every branch that's in the tree is there because of faith. Faith in who? Yeshua. Why? By the way, what is that olive tree in Romans chapter 11? What does it symbolize? Huh? Abraham? I agree. I think it, it symbolizes the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think it's the visible people of God. That means there are some branches that are going to be broken off, right? Because of unbelief. But we're all nurtured by the same root. What is that root? It is the promise God made to Abraham. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And Paul makes it very clear to us what that means in Galatians chapter 3. He, he makes a nice rabbinic midrash. He says, he doesn't say Zarim, seed. He says Zerah, seed, singular. In your seed, singular. Meaning whom? Yeshua. <laughs> now, anybody reading that, you know, Hebrew knows that the Hebrew word Zerah, seed, is only one time ever found in the plural. It's never found in the plural. Which is exactly Paul's point. His point is simply this. How come it's always found in the singular? He makes a nice little illustration. Because it refers to a single Israelite who stands as the Israelite par excellence. That is Yeshua. Right? That's why Paul is so intent on making sure that we understand that Abraham is our father. I, I, I honestly think that there are a, a lot of, of my, brother, my brothers and sisters in the Christian church who don't think it's even important at all that Abraham is their father. They say, look, I have Jesus, what else do I need? I don't need Abraham. Why does Paul in Romans 4 make it so essential that Abraham is our father? Why? Because he intends to save Israel. Everyone who's in Israel is saved. Here's another way to say it. Everyone who's in Yeshua is saved. Why can I say that the two are one and the same ultimately? Here's why. Because in the book of Isaiah, the, the Messiah is called the servant of the Lord. And so is the nation of Israel called the servant of the Lord. Isaiah says, who is this blind as my servant? Who are you talking about? Israel is a nation. When he talks about the shoot that will grow up in chapter 11, when he talks about the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53, who's he talking about? Yeshua. He goes back and forth between Yeshua and Israel. Yeshua and Israel. Why? Because it's like, it's like a, a pyramid, so to speak, where Yeshua is at the zenith, at the pinnacle. He is the model of all the rest. But to be in Yeshua means to be grafted into the chosen people of God. And if we are adopted into the chosen people of God, then we have the same privileges and we have the same responsibilities. Don't let anybody take away your freedom. In Yeshua. Some people say that when I preach this message or teach this message that I'm diminishing Jewish identity. They say, well, people who wear ZZ, people who eat kosher, people who keep the Sabbath, people who put a mezuzah on the door, people who keep the Moedim, um, etc., etc., everybody thinks they're Jewish even if they're not. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That's the same thing happened in Rome. Right? They didn't care about your pedigree. They said, if you keep the Shabbat, if you keep kosher, we're going to tell, we're gonna, you're Jewish, you pay the tax. But how does that diminish Jewish identity? I don't get it. Jewish people in the world today are a vast minority. 
Right? A huge minority. So if we are a huge minority, why should we confess about others who want to join us and look like us and be like us and do like us? I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. I hope it would be wonderful if, if all of a sudden on the front page of the New York Times I read a headline that says, Filipinos are more Jewish than we thought. <laughs> Everybody would say, whoa, 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 what do you mean by that? And you read the article and say, there's a revival in the Philippines. They're keeping the Sabbath. They're eating kosher. They're uh, keeping their festivals, the Jewish festivals. Uh, they're putting mezuzah on the door. They're wearing these feet. <laughs> and I'm supposed to be sad about that? I'm supposed to say, whoa, oh, oh, that somehow diminishes my identity. No, it doesn't. It enhances my identity. It's when Israel is, Israel is not replaced by those from the nations who God brings in. Israel is enlarged. Yeah. I know what some of you are saying. Some of you are saying, you know, maybe some of you who are teachers, maybe some of you who are pastors, say, if I were to adopt this, I'd lose my job. <laughs> Well, I have been there. I've been there. I was 21 years on staff. Well, no, I was not 21 years on staff, but I was 17 or 18 years on staff at a Christian church. And when I, in the middle of that, started uh, this group of, of Messianic Jews and Gentiles, um, uh, and we call ourselves Bethel, it was okay as long as it was viewed as evangelism to the Jews. But when I sat with my brothers and sisters, my fellow elders and overseers in that church and said to them, I have come to the conviction that this is what God wants every one of his children to do. Then there was trouble. Then say, no, 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 now you've gone too far. If you're doing it, can Jews say, fine, if you're saying that the way of Torah is for all of God's people, you, have, you are putting people back under the law. No! No one is under the law who is in Yeshua because that means under the condemnation of the law. So we have freedom from the condemnation of the law, and now we're free to be servants of righteousness. Right? Am I right? The servants of righteousness, does that connect at all with the Second Timothy? All scripture is given by inspiration of God is possible for God to truth, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What was that? That was, let me get it back up here. And that was good for instruction in what? For training in righteousness. I'm supposed to be a slave to righteousness, according to Paul? Oh, well, there it is. If I'm a slave to righteousness, who is my master? God. And what is it, what are his instructions? Torah. That's what Torah means. His instructions, his teaching. If you didn't know it, I'll tell you, Torah comes from the Hebrew word yara. Yara means to point out. It is also used of an archer who takes a, a, an arrow and sends the arrow to the target. Yara, to go straight to the target, to point it out. That's what the word Torah means. Okay? So, to say that it's only for the Jews, I don't find it. Now, here's the question, and I missed the covenant, sorry. <coughs> Are all believers in Yeshua members of a covenant? The answer is yes. If so, which covenant? Abrahamic covenant? Yes. Why? Because he's the father of us all, Romans 4. Do you see yourselves as part of the Abrahamic covenant? Yeah. What are some of the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant? I will bless those who bless you. I will curse the one who curses you. I will multiply you. I will give you a great name. Right? And in you, and in order to receive all the families, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. You say, well, Tim, has he given us a great name? Yes. He has attached you in brought you in, he has uh, grafted you into a people who have a great name. The very name has God's name in it, Israel. Right? 
And that's why he changed Jacob's name to Israel. So I promised I would give you a great name. <laughs> I'm going to give you Israel. I don't know exactly what Israel means, but I know what the last two letters mean. L means God. Okay. What about the New Covenant? Are we members of the New Covenant? The writer of the Hebrew says we are. It says we have a mediator of the New Covenant. Who's that mediator of the New Covenant? Yeshua. Yeshua. What are, the, what are the characteristics of the New Covenant? Um, I'm going to see if I can make this work now that I've got something else. Let's look at it. Let's just read it. Whenever we ask those questions, we should just go to the text and read it. I've got to go ahead and read the, uh, I'll leave the Hebrew up, but I'll, I'll pick up the subject. But they got the same hardly. I'll pop it up one more time. Okay, here we go. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. There it is, for in Kadashah, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, who's he make that with? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't the writer of Hebrews say that Yeshua is the mediator of a new covenant and we are part of it? Yes, he does. So how does that work? The new covenant is only made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So how do you as a Gentile, or how does anyone as a Gentile, get into the new covenant? By becoming part of Israel or Judah. But wait a minute. He says, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, why is it different? Because when we came out of Egypt, we broke that covenant. We were disobedient. We worshipped an idol. My covenant which they broke, that's why it's different. Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. Wait a minute. What happened to the house of Judah? Didn't it start out saying that it was the house of Israel and the house of Judah? Now he leaves out Judah. Why? No, no ideas? <laughs> because apparently when this covenant is going to be enacted, Judah and Israel will be reunited as one people. Wow. You know, there was a time when there was no Israel and Judah. It was Israel, oh, yeah. right? Okay, so that's where this is going. But this is the covenant which I will make for the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my Torah within them, and on their heart I will write it. So the, the, the characteristic of the new covenant is the Torah written on your heart. If you say that you are a member of the new covenant, and by the way, if you're in Yeshua, you are, then the characteristic of that is you have the Torah written on your heart. He didn't say if you were Jewish, you have the Torah written on your heart. He said, if you're in the covenant, you have the Torah written on your heart. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now look what it says. They will not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they will all know me. Does that mean know about me? No. He had already used the metaphor, even though I was a husband to them, right? Mm. They broke the covenant, even though I was a husband to them. When you're talking about husbands and wives and you use the Hebrew word no, what does it mean? It means to have intimate relations. Right? And back in Genesis, Adam knew his wife, Chava. And what happened by the fact that he knew her? She conceived and bore a son. Okay? So when it says, no man will have to say or teach his neighbor or a uh, his brother again saying, know the Lord, be loyal, be intimate, we have a close relationship with the Lord, where they will all have that relationship with me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And what is, why? For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Please give me the right answer to this question. What's the only way that sin and iniquity can be forgiven and remembered no more by God? Pastor Yeshua. So everyone that's in the New Covenant must have faith in Yeshua because that's the only way you can have your sins forgiven. 
So what is the characteristic of the New Covenant of which we're all part? The Torah written on the heart. What does it mean to have the Torah written on the heart? In the Greek, in the Greek world, you did all your thinking where? In your head. In the Hebrew world, where did you do your thinking? In your heart. Right. Where do you feel emotion? No, not in the heart. A little f further down. <laughs> in the stomach. In the, in the lower extremities. That's why the King James Version talked about bowels of compassion. Right? And, and even if you look at the Greek in Paul, Paul says he has kidneys of love. That's actually what the Greek says. So when it says the Torah is written on the heart, it means it, it is the grid through which you think, through which you make your decisions. Right? I had a professor, one of my favorite professors in college, Dr. James Greer, was the professor of philosophy. The first class I ever took from him was Philosophy 101. And he came in and he was a he was an interesting individual. He was not a common professor. Uh, all the kids loved, we all loved him because he was different. He made the class exciting. And the first class he came in, and he had on the most ridiculous pair of glasses I've ever seen. They were about this big, about this big around the uh -huh. eye, and they were bright red. And he didn't say anything. He didn't smile. Said, so, "Okay, class." It's time to get started. I have your roster. I want to make sure I know your names. He said, this is how we're going to conduct class. This is when you'll have the examinations. Here is your textbook, and so forth and so on. And he went on for about 30 minutes and said nothing about these ridiculous glasses that he had on. And suddenly he stopped, and he said, you know what? Everyone in this class is red. They're all red. I don't understand it. Why are you so red? And some of the girls were embarrassed and they were snickering. And some of the guys were looking at the city like, this guy's really off his rocker. <laughs> and uh, so then he took off a pair of glasses and he said, oh, it was the glasses I had on. He said, that's my goal for this class, is to help you take the glasses you have and take them off so that you see things clearly. Now, why do I tell you that illustration? To help you remember this, that when the Torah is written on the heart, it means you have Torah glasses on. It means you see life through Torah. You make your decisions through Torah. You take the righteousness of God as described in the Torah, and you say, this is how I'm going to look at life, this is how I'm going to receive life, this is how I'm going to make decisions in life, so forth and so on. That's what it means to have the Torah written on the heart. It's the code by which you live and think and make your decisions. Okay. I don't even know what time it is. Does it matter? When am I supposed to be done here? Anyway. Um, okay, I just finished these classes and we'll find out. Um, there are those who say, I really don't have time to develop this, but let me just, uh, I'll just, I'll go back to this other so we have at least the scriptures in front of me. There are those who say, well, okay, Tim, I will go as far as to say that the Torah is for everyone. But not everything in the Torah is for everyone. For instance, in the Torah itself, there are commandments for women and for men. There are commandments for kings, there are commandments for servants. There are commanders for slave owners and commanders for slaves, etc., etc. So maybe even though the Torah is for everyone, not everything in the Torah is for everyone. Have you heard this kind of teaching? Some of you say yes. Yes. This session. Okay. Good. I've got six minutes. Uh, okay. How do we know that there are? commandments that are given specifically for men and other commandments given specifically for women. How do we know that? It's a pretty obvious question. You can give me the obvious answer. <laughs> because it says so, right? <laughs> the reason we know that there are special there are special commandments for kings is like to 
service is because it says so. Okay, very good. No problem. You see, what I want to keep going back to is the biblical text. Now, show me the list where it says, these commandments are for Jews, and these are for non-Jews. I don't find the list. And when, you, when somebody says, well, it says in Leviticus that all of the native-born shall sit in, in the sukkah at the festival of Sukkot, it says native-born, but that's because they haven't read the whole book. If you go into Deuteronomy, it says the same thing, but it says native-born, the foreigner, the one who is uh, visiting you, etc., etc. Okay? The other thing is, some are trying to tell us now that when you have the word foreigner in the Torah, it really means a convert. Let me, I know I don't have time to develop this, but if someone would please show me in the Bible anywhere where God prescribes a ceremony by which a non-Jewish person can be given the status of Jewish person, please show me. It is not there. Any more than you could say, you know, some ceremony over a piece of ham and say, now it's turned into salmon. <laughs> Right? That isn't going to work. Okay? So when it says, as in, for instance, and by the way, this is, this is the one that uh, people always dispute. Uh, in, I'm in Numbers, uh, I'm in Numbers uh, 15. It says, the one who presents his offering shall present the Lord a great offering, so forth and so on. So it's talking about sacrifices. You shall pre prepare wine for a drink offering. It tells you how much for each lamb, for a ram, a certain number. So it's giving you all the laws of how to bring the sacrifice, how to bring a drink offering or a libation. When you prepare a bull, this is how you're supposed to do it. You shall offer the bull with its grain and so forth and so on. Okay. As a drink offering, a half a hint of wine. It's giving you all the stipulations, the stipulations for various kinds of sacrifices. Thus shall shall be done for each ox or for each ram, or for each male lamb, or for the goats, according to the number you prepare, so shall you do, everyone according to the number. All who are native shall do these things in this manner, in presenting an offering by fire, as the soothing aroma to the Lord. If an alien, now that would, alien is kind of a bad word, it sounds like somebody from outer space. <laughs> but what we mean by alien is someone who is not native, not a native-born Israelite, okay? If an alien sojourns with you, or one who may be among you throughout your generations, and he wishes to make an offering by fire as a soothing aroma to the Lord, just as you do, so he shall do. Amen. Now, pardon me? What is going to say again? Okay. Okay. Um, as for the assembly, there shall be one statute for you and for the alien who sojourns with you. A perpetual statute for our generation. As you are, so shall the foreigner be before the Lord. How could it be any more clear? In fact, it's so clear that the rabbis say, oh, this must be talking about a convert. And even some messianics are now saying, that when you read the word foreigner or gear, you should be convert. There's nothing in the Bible that says a Gentile person should convert to be a Jewish person or even that they could. If everybody converted to be Jewish, God would be the God of the Jews only. He's not. He's the God of all the nations. And that's why as Jews we are not complete until the, the chosen ones from the nations join us and you are not complete until we join you. Yeah. Right? Am I right? Yeah. There is to be one Torah. Look at that's what it says. Uh, verse 16. Torah akhat. One Torah and one uh, ordinance there shall be for you okay. and for, uh, for the aliens who sojourns with you. Okay. I don't see how to be any so, with that in mind, if I cause some of you to be, say, wow, Tim, I know that's pretty heavy. You know, I understand, I've been there. I walked that path, coming out of what 
35 years of being actively involved in the Christian <coughs> church, 25 of which were in leadership in the Christian church. I understand what it means to sit at a board meeting and say, am I really going to tell them that I think that we all should be observing the Sabbath and setting the Sabbath apart? I know that's going to go over like a lead zeppelin. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I can guarantee you this. I can tell you from my own testimony. There's nothing more wonderful than to put your head down on the pillow at night. And even though you can say, Lord, I need your forgiveness, I need your mercy, you can say, Lord, I love your Torah. I love your ways. I want to walk in your ways. I want to do what you say. I don't care. I don't care if how much it costs. If you were to tell me to paint my nose green every morning, I would do it. Even if I didn't understand why. Because if you said it, it's important. If you commanded it, it's good. It's glorifying to you and it's good for me. So, I'm going to do your commandments by your strength, through your spirit, as best I can, in the place where I am, and I'm going to honor you. I'm not going to get high about it or high-handed about it. I'm not going to be judgmental about to others, but I'm going to walk humbly before you and seek your ways and trust that your word is true that you will bless me. Amen. Amen. And that, that's been my message for numbers of years. And there have been people that say, Jim, 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 you're wrong, you're wrong, it's for Jews only. There are Messianic groups that are telling the Gentiles to go back to the Christian church uh, you know what? I think they're paranoid about who they are. <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest with you. My first level of identity, if somebody says to me, are you Jewish? I always say this. Yes, I'm Jewish and I'm a believer in Yeshua. Because my belief in Yeshua, my being, my being in Yeshua is my primary identity. Amen. And if you're in Yeshua and if I'm in Yeshua, we're one together. One new man, one new person. The middle wall has been broken down. We're walking together to help each other do what God commands. Okay. okay, we can do some Q&A. We want to take a short break to stand up or not? No. You, just, you know, the leaders of this, the leaders of this, uh, of this seminar are ruthless. <laughs> no way. So the first question is, I think this is very sacred to me, okay? It's just to see, to see all the teaching of the Messianic world that the name of the Father is Hashem, Adonai, and Yahweh, the Son of Yeshua, and the Holy Spirit is Ruach HaKodesh. The question is, what is the everlasting name mentioned in Zechariah 14, 9? The only name. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Let me say this about that. I'll be happy to um, dialogue with you. You can take a big argument. You know, um, two Jews, three opinions, four synagogues, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, we like to go back and forth, and when we do that, we're not mad at each other. We argue, we debate, we get in each other's face, then we eat, eat, eat a meal together and have a good time. Okay. Uh, I'll just tell you this. No one knows how the four-letter name of God is pronounced. No one knows. If, if you think you're sure that you don't, please show me your data. Okay? I think I can prove to you beyond any reasonable doubt that you don't know. There are some good guesses. Some of you say Yahweh, okay? Or Yahweh. Yahuwah. All of these other things. Okay. I can guarantee you that no one knows for sure. You may think that you, if you've had a word from the Lord, a revelation, or a dream, or a vision, or something, okay, but somebody else has had a similar revelation dream, and he pronounces it differently than you do. <laughs> uh, I have studied this. I've looked at it very carefully. Uh, all, all scholars of the, of the Hebrew Scriptures agree that the four-letter name of God 
it is uncertain how it needs to be pronounced. Now here's my logic. I don't have any problem pronouncing your name, but I don't want to mispronounce it. Why should I? He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Even I'm hesitant to speak some of your names because I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce it correctly. If so with earthly friends and important people, how much more so with the King of Kings? Secondly, we find every good reason because we find people in the Bible doing the same thing. When Moshe came down off the mountain, he does not say to the people, Yosheh he spoke to me. He says, Adonai spoke to me. We have Yeshua in the book of Matthew. He doesn't say kingdom of Yodhei Vave, he says kingdom of heaven. Heaven is a circumlocution, a substitute word for the divine name. Even Yeshua, when he's talking to the Bible, says, Wait in Jerusalem for the power from on high. When the, until the Spirit comes from the power of, from the one who is on high. That's another way of saying the name of God without actually pronouncing it. If I knew for certain how the name was pronounced, I wouldn't have any problem pronouncing it as long as I was reverent to doing it. Mm -hmm. But we don't know the name in terms of how it's pronounced. And I'd rather not practice and mistake it. So I use Hashem, I use Adonai, I use a substitute. Now, the question was, how do we know what the four-letter name, what the uh, whole, Zechariah? And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be one, and his name is one. Now, my translation says the only one, and that's correct. In the Shema, when it says, Shema Israel, and the night will hail in the night of God. Let me put that up there just above the first one. Okay, so well, that's Deuteronomy uh, 6, 4, and Zechariah 14, nine. Put them on top. So here we are over in Hebrew. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad. What does it mean that the Lord is one? It doesn't mean that the Lord is a unity. That's not what Yachad means here. Amen. It means the Lord Amen. is the only one. Numerically one. How do we know? Because what does the next verse say? So you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. In other words, you don't divide it between more than one. Because there's only one. He's the only one. That's the same thing that it means in 14.9. The Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be, will be manifest, will be confessed, will be known in the world as the only God, and His name will be the only one. In other words, it's going to be an eradication of idolatry. Amen. Everyone will know that there are no false gods, that those are really false, those are really demons. Those are not gods. That's all I understand. That's all I know. Next. Uh, this is the question. Uh, did Jesus Christ abolish the marriage bond? No. The question, did Yeshua abolish the Sabbath? Absolutely not. Why would he? Then he would be a sinner. Hey, Colossians 2.17. Maybe he's referring to that. Well, Colossians uh, doesn't say that the Sabbath has been done away with, but if anything, it says that the Sabbath is dead. Uh, someone mentions Colossians. Let's look at it. Uh, Colossians uh, 2, uh, 15 through 18. <clears throat> Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. That doesn't say the Sabbath day has been done away with it, says don't let anybody judge you with regard to it. Right? Amen. It doesn't say there is no Sabbath. It says don't let people judge you with regard to it. What, was it, what would that mean? How would they judge you in regard to the Sabbath? Go be the tractate in the Mishnah Shabbat. Have you ever heard of the tractate Eruvim? No. Okay. In the first century, there were so many laws about Shabbat you couldn't keep them straight. You Amen. needed a personal lawyer to walk with you to make sure you did <laughs> Serious business. Amen. Serious. So here are these Messianic believers, many of whom are Gentiles, they're just learning. They don't even know the whole Torah, not to speak of all the additional laws that the rabbis have added. You know, how much could you carry on Shabbat? How far could you walk on Shabbat? Uh, what, what about in the room? Could you put the food in the roof? What could you uh, could you lay down? How many times could you lay down? When you stood up, how many times could you stand up? 
I mean, so forth and so on. Could you wash? What happens if you had a cut? Could you put equipment on it? Serious. Okay? What happens if you had a broken bone? Could the broken bone be set and, and straightened on the chip or not? You can go through this practice and time down in. And so you have these believers and you have these uh, other uh, Jewish people saying, you're not keeping the Sabbath. I saw you walking too many feet on the Sabbath. <laughs> I saw you carrying something you're not supposed to carry on the Sabbath. You're not keeping the Sabbath. Paul says, look, you are, you are not under the obligation of men's laws. Don't let people judge you with regard to their own laws. The Sabbath, you were not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for you. Okay? That doesn't mean it's done away with the Sabbath. It means you're to understand the Sabbath as a day of rest which reflects the day of eternity. Amen. Not a day of burden. You know that there was a sect of Jews in, in Spain who felt that you could not use the restroom on Sabbath? <laughs> <laughs> this is the truth. And they also said that you should have no light on Sabbath because all light is a fire. And you're not going to have a fire on the Sabbath. This is the way they interpreted it. They sat in their homes. They fasted on Friday so they would not have to use the restroom on Shabbat. They sat in their homes in darkness. It was a day of bondage. It was a day of of sadness, not a day of joy. No, that's an extreme, okay? <laughs> Most Jews wouldn't have done that. But there was a small sect in Spain who did. And so all I'm telling you is that you can take men's rules to a degree where it takes away the joy. This is exactly what Yeshua said. I came, I didn't come to abolish the star. I came to make it stand up. I came to make it alive to be what God intended it to be in the life of people. No, he didn't. And, how, and by the way, how do we know? Guess what? When he returns, he's going to be keeping the Sabbath. Yeah. You can read Isaiah 56 and Isaiah 58, which is clearly in the context of the millennial reign. And what does he say? Blessed are those who keep the Sabbath. Yeah. If he knew that he was going to destroy the Sabbath, why in Matthew 24 does he say, Pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath. Who cares? He's going to abolish the Sabbath. It doesn't matter. <laughs> No, you have every evidence that Yeshua has held all of the Torah. If he didn't, he's a sinner. And if he sinned, he's not the perfect lamb that the sacrifice. He kept the Sabbath, and he's going to keep it again when he returns. And I don't find anywhere in the scriptures where it says in between it's got a problem. This one isn't certain tight. Please explain Malachi 3.10. Mm. Uh, <laughs> because I read about uh, Old Testament tithing and New Testament giving, how do I give to the Lord? Is it really a basis of our blessings from our God? Or uh, and then it says, should I be a tither or a giver? Okay. You cannot tithe today. Regardless of what the, the evangelist on the television tells you, you cannot tithe today. What? All the tithes in the Torah are given to the priest. If you give your tithe to somebody else, you have not followed Torah. So, are there priests that are at Pumpkin today? No. You can't tithe. You're supposed to bring your tithe to the temple or give it to the Levite in your midst. Can't do it. So, forget tithe. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not a good institution for us to consider. Why did God say take a test? Maybe that's a good place to start. What is a gift? A gift is a, a, is a free will gift. <laughs> For praise to God. Has He blessed you? Has He done something great for you? Has He blessed you materially? So forth and so on. Well, then give a gift. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, you can do it a number of ways. Give it to a, a, a work that's furthering the, uh, the Word of God, that's, ex that's expressing the Word of God further. Give it to somebody who's poor, who is in need, widows, orphans. Right? If you have a community, and that community is going to need funds to maintain, give your gift and your offering to the community. But it's not under obligation. It's what you do because of your, of your heart. Now, when the temple is reinstituted, will we be required to bring a tithe? Yes. Interesting discussion, which we won't go into here. There's nothing in the Torah that says you're supposed to tithe your money. It just says you're supposed to tithe your field, your fruits, yeah. and your crop, or your crops yeah. and your animals. Yeah. Yeah. So what did the people do who weren't farmers? <laughs> there were plenty of people who weren't farmers, right? There were craftsmen and so forth and so on. Potters. How did they tie? Good question. 
This is why you have offerings. Everyone has, a, that has an open heart to give to the Lord, to honor the Lord with the substance that you have, can do so with a good honor. Okay? There's still a, this one. Oh, three tenths. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and cast me down this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it will close. So what's my house? The temple. Yeah. His house is not the church. Not the church building. Okay. Um, the point here was that they were not to uh, hold their tithes off year after year after year after year. They were supposed to bring them in. Why? What time? Well, we have more than one time, right? We have the first time, the second time, and the rabbi had the third and fourth time. Okay, so you 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 have you have the first time. The first fruits go to the maintenance of the Levites. You have the half shekel tax, which is considered kind of a tithe. Okay, this goes to the maintenance of the temple and so forth. It's needed. So he says, don't squander your tithe elsewhere. Bring it in, and for the maintenance of the temple. But this verse can only be fulfilled when the temple is standing in function, which it is not today. So for Christian pastors to say, this tells you you should bring your money and give it to the church, or uh, 700 Club says, you know, send us your paycheck and you'll get twice as much, don't believe it. That's not what this verse says. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Uh, how do you keep a kosher diet in a non-kosher observing country? And how about your business and something to do with pork? Should you give it up? Okay. Uh, first question, how can you keep kosher in a non-kosher uh, environment? Uh, well, you, if you want to, you can do it the same way Daniel did. Vegetables are all kosher. You say, well, that wouldn't food. Boy, that wouldn't be too good to eat a veg have, have vegetarian diet. Well, you know what? If, uh, there's, there's kosher and there's rabbinic kosher, okay? My understanding is this. What God required of me is that the blood be poured out on the ground. Mm. In reality, you're not going to get every speck of blood out of the meat, ever, no matter what you do, okay? But that was not his point. His point was that the blood was to be discarded in its hole. It wasn't to be used, okay? So meat that has been slaughtered properly, that is, with the blood taken out, can then be used, can be washed if you want, and wash it before you cook it, uh, and cook it uh, and get the blood out, okay? That, to me, kosher, obviously it has to be a clean animal. It has to be an animal that has to flow with milk and choose to cut, okay? So that would be sheep, goat, bovine, and so forth, okay? Those, do, do they do hunting here? Venison? No, no. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay. No. Uh, in terms of what do we do about foods that are pre-pared, like canned foods and processed foods. I would be very careful. Look for a hexer. Look for a. a do you know what the uh, kosher signs look like on foods? Sometimes you have to look really hard because they make them small. They make them really small. Uh, but you know, there's all kinds of kosher marks. Circle U, circle K, square K, triangle K. There's all kinds of kosher marks. What about halal? Halal is not necessarily kosher. Okay? Now, I can go on and on about that. Uh, maybe we don't have time today. But some would say you can't eat meat that's marked or food that's marked halal because it's been uh, blessed in the name of Allah. Allah is a, is a pagan god, which is true. Allah is a demon god. And uh, you say, well, it's been blessed. Okay. But Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 that really that doesn't do anything to the meat. Just because someone doesn't, doesn't change the meat at all. Okay. What you should be careful about, though, is not eating it if you know somebody who is watching you eat it is going to be offended by it. And you shouldn't sure serve it to someone if you know that they will be offended that it has been slaughtered halal. Okay? So those would be the restrictions, but there's nothing... It, it doesn't make the meat pain. Okay? <laughs> any, more, any more than when you eat a hamburger, it makes you a hamburger. Okay? <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, given those restraints, I think you can find a way to do kosher. Even in the Philippines. I mean, we've been eating kosher since we've been here. And you just have to be careful. You know, there's a lot of shrimp, there's a lot of pork, there's a lot of uh, other kinds of uh, things that are off the list. 
You just have to be careful. And vegetables are always safe. Yes. If you have, if you have uh, uh, places that make food, uh, Indian food, food for people from India that are vegan, it's going to be kosher. There's going to be no meat in it. There's going to be not. What about meat, mixing meat and milk? I don't think it's a problem. If you do, then that's going to be another level of kosher you'll have to observe. But I don't think the Torah requires us to separate meat and milk. Okay. Um, I'll be considered a little congregation in which church service on the Shabbat, where there is only one speaker and no thought study of the Torah. Well, each community has to decide what they want to do and how they're going to do it. I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, you decide. There's nothing in the apostolic scriptures that tell us how a meeting of a community of leaders is to be conducted. It gives us some parameters, right? We can go, for instance, to Acts 2, 242. They were continually devoting themselves to four things. The apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And you say, well, does the apostles' teaching include the Torah? Yes. The apostles were teaching about how the Torah was to be applied, how the prophecies related to Yeshua, and so forth and so on. We know this when we look at <laughs> Luke 4 and other places where we have some you know, illustration of the, the meaning. What is fellowship? Holding things in common. My suggestion is, is that you ought to always have some time during your meeting where you have a chance for people in the meeting to share and to fellowship together. The breaking of bread, what is that? That is not the Lord's so-called Lord's table or Eucharist. The breaking of bread simply means eating a meal together. And to prayer. And actually, if you look, and I'll put it up, um, if, you put, if you look in the Greek, those of you that can make your way a bit in the Greek, it says, here we go, uh, to the kalefe, to arbon, the breaking of bread, and look what we have here. This word right here is the word the. And the prayers. It's plural. So, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. That probably refers to set prayers. That's liturgy. So you can decide what you want to do about praying together. But there ought to be times where you pray together, times where you study the scriptures and, and talk about them together, times to fellowship and times to eat. That would be the common things that happen in the earliest Messianic congregation. For those of you that say, well, I'm in a congregation where it's mostly a Christian church with a little tummy or something. Well, you know, if that's the best you have, that's the best you have. Maybe if you are humble and pray and seek that the Lord might change things, who knows? It might change. You know, or maybe, it, maybe it's uh, time to start another community that has a different format. Uh, but we can't say one format is right and another is wrong. We can just have general parameters and seek to move that direction. Yeshua said the Father seeks worshippers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Are we supposed to worship Yeshua too? Well, Thomas did. Thomas fell down before Yeshua when he saw him and said, My Lord and my God. And don't let anybody tell you that, oh, there's a comma there, or there's punctuation. My Lord, my God. That doesn't work. Um, when I read about Yeshua in the book of Revelation, it looks to me like he's worshipped. The Lamb comes, and what happens? They fall down. They worship him. Right? Some would say, well, well he wasn't worshipped when he came in his first advent. Well, he came as a servant, as a humble man, and he didn't come saying when he was 12 years old, oh, by the way, I'm the Messiah. He didn't say that at first, did he? In fact, what did he tell his disciples all the time when he, when he actually healed? What did he tell them? Don't tell anybody. He told the person that was healed, don't tell anybody. No, don't tell anybody. What did they do? They always went and told people. But that's okay. Why did he tell them not to tell anybody? Because, please understand this, Yeshua is Jewish, not was Jewish, is Jewish. And what's the Hebrew perspective on this? You don't tell somebody who you are until you show them that you are. Don't give me your words. Show me. How was Yeshua going to show them that he was the Messiah? Well, what did they think that a Messiah should do? Their view of Messiah was what? He comes, he conquers Rome, 
And he gives us freedom. Wrong definition of Messiah. If he were to say, I, was the, I am the Messiah, what would they say? Good, let's go after the Romans. He said, no, 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 that's not what I meant. So when did he first come right out and say he was the Messiah at his trial? Right? Caiaphas says to him, tell us, flat out, tell us, are you the Messiah or not? And he says, you have said it yourself. <laughs> and you will see the Son of Man coming with power, sitting at the right hand of God and coming on clouds. And what did he do? He gripped his, his robe. He said, oh, this is blasphemy. Why was it blasphemy? Because he made himself out to be with God, one with God, the Messiah. However, what does Paul say after the resurrection? He was declared, this is Romans 1, 4, he was declared to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection of the Messiah. Right? Okay, let's, uh, let's make sure we have that uh, correct. I want to make sure I don't misquote. Who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of Holiness, Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord. Okay. So, uh, is he worthy to be worshipped? Absolutely. When he returns, is he going to be worshipped? Absolutely. I don't have any problem saying, Yeshua, I bow before you. When, if, you don't have, you have a king in, uh, yeah. you have a queen? No, no. Wait, there's it. Huh? Okay. In silence. Maybe in silence. <laughs> when the king of king returns, you won't have any trouble. You won't have any trouble bowing down before him. You won't have any trouble falling on your face and saying, He is the Lord of Lords. No problem at all. So if you're going to do that when he returns, why not start now? Okay. Is baptism necessary for grafted in believers? Is baptism necessary? The mikvah is a command. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't have to be a big ceremony. There's nothing in the Torah that says something that a whole bunch of people have to be there, but that'd be nice if they were. According to Jewish tradition, and I think it's probably this tradition that Yeshua was following at the time, it most certainly was, I think, what Yochanan Ramadil was doing with John the Baptist, there needs to be a witness that you have gone all the way under, and then you need to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. What is the baptism? It's a change of status. It's a witness to yourself and to others that you have died in the Messiah and you have resurrected afresh in Him. You've died in Him and you've risen to newness of life. You can do it. You can do it in a swimming pool. And guess what? Having a baptism doesn't mean you become a member of some church. Okay? Baptism is a witness of your faith and your oneness with the Jews. And, yes, it's required. It's good. Yes. You do it. Yes. Yeah. You're already you can be, you can, you can do a mikvah as many times as you want. Yeah. The, Jew, the Jewish people in the first century did mikvah all the time. Every time you got in the mikvah, you did a baptism. <laughs> so if you want to, I'm saying it's the thing. You know, now that I have come to really understand more of who I am in the Messiah by grafting into, into uh, Israel, I want to do a thing for as kind of a dedication for that. Go for it. Great. Find a couple of witnesses and say, let's go down to this pool or let's go to this river or you can do it in the ocean. The ocean around here is pretty cold. Huh? <laughs> Maybe not too bad. Just go in, go all the way under. Come back out and say, that's no expression of what has happened to me in my life. I've been making it. There was a teaching candidate to us this morning. If you are a Sunday worshiper instead of keeping the Shabbat, you already have the mark of the peace. What do you think about that? I have been there in San Francisco for more than two years now. Okay, I know there are people who are saying this. Uh, that's absolutely wrong. First of all, what is the mark of the beast? Anybody know? Um, what is the mark of the beast? 666. Six, six. No, 666 six is not the mark of the beast. Number of a man. Number of the beast. It's, it's the number by which we, we are to decipher who the mark, who the beast is. 
But it never says that the 66 is the mark. Um, worshiping on Sunday is not the mark of the beast. I'm quite convinced. Uh, it appears as though some, whatever the mark of the beast is, and I think the beast there, we're talking about Revelation 13, uh, I think the mark of the beast to be an identification with the anti-Messiah. It could be something economic, it could be something by way of a credit card, it could be something, who knows? Some have said it's a chip or something like that. I, I don't even care to speculate. But it means that you have aligned yourself with the anti-Messiah, and that you're willing to give him whatever he desires by way of um, uh, glory and worship or whatever, and as a result, he spares your life and gives you food or whatever, which is a crop. Because if you make deals with Satan, you're always going to lose. Okay. Don't, you can't trust Satan to keep his word. You know why he's the father of life. Okay. So don't get stupid into that one. Um, look. The earliest believers, it seems to me, is from what I read in the church fathers, worshipped both on Shabbat and on Sunday. They did both. Amen. Amen. You can find this in the earliest church fathers. They eventually gave up Shabbat kept Sunday. Amen. Uh, why did they do that? Well, good question. I think they did it first and foremost to separate themselves from the synagogue. You know, I mean, if you're keeping the Sabbath, a lot of people think you're Jewish without ever asking you. Why? Because the Jews have kept the Sabbath throughout the generations. Remember the phrase, it's not so much that we have kept the Sabbath, but that the Sabbath has kept us. So, um, they wanted to move to a day other than Sabbath to separate themselves, identify themselves differently than the synagogue. Were they wrong in that? I'm, I'm convinced they were. Are there a lot of people who worship on Sunday today who have genuine hearts of love and faith to God, who genuinely want to please God, who are truly born from above? I think the answer is indubitably yes. There are also many who are deceived in their own faith. We know this from Matthew 7.22. Many will say in that day, didn't we do this, and this, and this, and this. Those are all the things that the church is doing. And you say, depart from me, I'm doing this. So there are a lot of people who are self-deceived. But just because somebody worships on Sunday doesn't mean they're pagan or they're not going to be Think more clearly. Maybe they have been led into that by teachers. Okay? Pray for them. Help them to humbly see what might be a better way. Um, you will be asking the last two questions. And I guess... Right, and we're going to we're developing a frequently asked questions section on the Torah Resource website, which will be governed by keywords. So you can put in a keyword like Sabbath, and it will bring up all the questions that relate to Sabbath. And when you click on that, it will bring up an answer that we have, that we've made. So it'll be kind of like a database to get quick answers to these kinds of questions. And we'll post the questions, and perhaps many of these that we've already answered. Plus others that we have. What is the difference between the two names, Yeshua and Yahushua? Yeah, Yahushua, Yahushua is the name Joshua. Yahushua is the name Joshua. Now people are trying to say that Yeshua's name starts with Yah, like Y A H, Yod A in the in the Hebrew. And they're trying to say that Yeshua's name is Yahushua. Wrong. Well, it's not. It's absolutely not. They're saying, but wait a minute. The name Yeshua, Yesu, in the Septuagint, is how the Septuagint translates Yehoshua. Which is true. Okay? Joshua is translated in the Old Testament Septuagint by the name Jesus. So they're saying, Jesus and Joshua are the same. So therefore, Joshua starts with yod Yahoshua. And so Yeshua's name must be Yahashua. No, it's wrong. Absolutely wrong. Okay? Um, Yeshua was a common name in the first century. It's found in other writings. It's found in archaeological writings. His name did not have a hand in it. It was Yod, Shin, Vav, Ein. Yeshua. And in the Galilee, they oftentimes truncated the last vowel and it became Yeshua. Which is not the derogatory name derived by the rabbis, even though later on they used it as one. That was not where it came from. 
So the whole idea that the name of Yeshua has begins with Yah, the name of God is wrong. It's not linguistically or historically or archaeologically proven. In fact, just the opposite opposite is proven. Okay? It's Yeshua. Okay? And that's why he said, You shall call his name Yeshua for what? He will save. Not Yah will save. He will save his people from their sin. Okay? That's what Yeshua means. Okay. So our last question, some question. The first one is, is there a teaching in Judaism that Cain was the son of a serpent? Yes. The rabbis have all kinds of midrash saying who Cain was. Um, was, he the, no, was he the son of a serpent? No. How do we know that? Because Satan, as best we can tell, is like an angel, and angels do not cohabit with words of uh, humans. Sorry, I know everybody says, oh yes, look at what happened to Mary. That wasn't an angel, that was the real Harkodesh. Right? That was God himself. That's a whole other story. The sons of men and the sons of God in Genesis 6, I think, should be interpreted differently. That gives me too close to mythology if we have these spirit beings being able to impregnate women, uh, human women. I don't think that's the case. So the idea that Cain is the offspring of the serpent or Satan is a myth that has been perpetrated in some uh, rabbinic writings, uh, but many of the rabbis don't adhere to it either. The last question. When did the 17 weeks of Daniel start and when did it end? That's a long one. Uh, you know, maybe what we should do is just tell you that we'll have the CDs from the, uh, the CDs from the last conference. But I, I can just tell you, generally speaking, okay? Um, and I'll make this short, believe it or not, because I know you're all hot and, and need to get some hair. No, it's okay. You can wait. Okay. First of all, as I was talking to my brother right over here, I just want to show you something. I know, we're talking Hebrew here. Okay. The festival of weeks is also called what? No, that's too cold. The festival of weeks is Shavuot. Shavuot. They end in Oak, right? Any of you who know Hebrew know that Oak is a feminine plural ending. Shavuot is week. Shavuot is weeks. Feminine plural. Look what we have here. Shavuim, not Shavuot, Shavuim, masculine plural. Why? How many times does the masculine plural of the word weeks show up in the Bible? Only if any. Nowhere else. I think he's telling us that there's, that's a sign, that's a cryptic sign, that's what we call a cipher. Say, wait a minute, Daniel, you missed, you, 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 you spelled it wrong. No, I spelled it wrong on purpose. Why? Because I want you to know that the word seven and the word seventy is fluid in the writings. It can stand for days, it can stand for weeks, it can stand for shemitot, which are a group of seven years, or it can stand for jubilees, which is a group of forty-nine years. Seven sevens. So when I read seventy, 70 weeks, or seventy groups of seven have been decreed for your people, your holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. I don't think it's holy place, I think it's to anoint Yeshua. That brings us to the very end. That brings us to, that's the whole picture. So I think that 77 to 70 jubilees, it begins with the first jubilee in Exodus, after we went into the land and were there for 49 years, we, start, we had the first jubilee. Count, count to 70, and the whole story is finished. The millennium has started. The Messiah is here. The end of time is come. The 62, which follow, so you are to know and discern from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That 7 and 62 is how much? 69. 69. Everybody's looking for the 70th week. He doesn't want you to look for the 70th week. The reason he left it at 69 is because he wants you to know it's incomplete. Now we have years. 69 years, 69 times weeks, the 7, 483 years, brings us right to the 
life of Yeshua and his being cut off, cut off after the 62 weeks. So the 69 weeks is one period, one small period, within the overall scope of 77s. When Yeshua said, when Peter came to Yeshua and said, how often should I uh, forgive somebody who sinned against me? Uh, 70 times, what did he say? 70 times 7. Lemek said the same thing. He said, if Cain is avenged 70 times, I'll be avenged 70 times 7. What does 70 times 7 indicate or symbolize? The whole thing, the biggest, the complete, all of it. Okay? That's my short answer. To all fellow readers, the powerful and inspiring words of the Torah and the good news of Yeshua our Messiah, awarded by the Asia Pacific Messianic Fellowship and the Lahin Buhau Association Incorporated at Filipinas Heritage Library, Makati City, Philippines, on the third day of May, year 2011. Signed by Ted Franco, Coordinator ACMF, and Juicy Buduan, Founder Director of Lahin Buhau Foundation. Uh, thank you so much. I have another gift for you and for your wife. A remembrance of the Christmas and please keep the good things in your prayers. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. By all means. Okay.